video today. So I'm just gonna run through some channel updates and some news and a couple of things I wanted to go over. I've made this little uh, Arduino device here. It's just a tiny little $6 chip. And what it does, it connects via Wi-Fi and every time I get a new subscriber on YouTube, this little speaker will go and let me know there's a new subscriber and if someone leaves, it does this like descending tone. Um, so that's been really cool and it's been working. And thanks for everyone who noticed this on Twitter and I could hear people unsubscribing and resubscribing. And uh, thanks to Samuel A, who's been doing that to me for the last 24 hours and a couple of other of you as well. But I haven't been able to catch it on film, so hopefully we'll get a new subscriber while we're sitting here talking. I've been thinking a lot about Arduino lately and getting into um, electronics, uh, because there's a few useful things that you can do in astronomy with Arduino. People are using Arduino to make their own focuses. They're using Arduino for all sorts of different things. Uh, one thing that I was thinking about, which I'd like to do, is make a celestial pole finder. Because when you're out at a star party and you've got no point of reference, uh, you have to figure out where the South Celestial Pole or the North Celestial Pole is often in the daytime, so you don't have the stars as a reference. Um, so I think if you used an Arduino with a combination of uh, the a compass module and a laser module, and you angled that laser at the same degrees that the offset from the Celestial Pole is, you could theoretically make a device that will find the celestial pole for you and point a laser directly at it. And if you had a laser, it would just make it so much easier to adjust your tripod legs. Do you think that's a good idea? Should I go ahead and try and make a celestial pole finder? And if I did, is it something that you would buy? Do you go to star parties often enough to justify that sort of thing? The other thing I wanted to talk to you about was I just developed a little astronomy weather app and that is for Australians only I'm afraid but if you are an Australian subscriber um, do check out Bintel Astronomy Weather and I'll leave the link in the description. Uh, this weather report takes open weather data but I wanted to format it for astronomers so the things that we care about uh, basically is it cloudy, is it going to rain and is it too windy to do imaging. And it also has the uh, moon phase there as well. So you can tell at a glance whether it's going to be clear and it gives you those that breakdown in three hour increments so that you can check every afternoon and see if it's going to be clear throughout the night. Basically green is good and red is bad. Uh, astronomy news. There has been one news item which I thought was particularly newsworthy and that was this thing with the Japanese researchers who discovered the most distant object in the solar system, which is mind blowing to me. Now, it would be mind blowing whoever discovered the most distant object in the solar system, but the fact that these guys did it without an observatory, they did it on a high school roof, they discovered the most distant object in the solar system using a pair of Celestron 11 inch Rasas, which is the same telescope that I have in my backyard. I can't believe that academics have used such available, readily available consumer equipment for such an amazing discovery. Now, of course, they're not actually directly imaging something like this. What they did was that they used a... Hey, new subscriber! Did you see that? It just uh, gave me the new subscriber tone. Thank you, whoever that was. As I was saying, um, what was I saying? Oh yeah, they didn't directly image the object. What they did was that they were trained on a star field and when you measure the light curve or the light output of a star and then you see a dip, you know that something is transiting in front of that star. They're able to determine the existence of an object out You hear that? That's my losing subscriber sound. So... <laughs> it's quite melancholy, isn't it? Sorry, whoever that was. Hope I didn't offend you. Uh, yeah, so the paper is available in Nature and it's just amazing news. I'm sure it makes Celestron very happy to know that their telescopes were used in such an amazing way. Okay, a bit of channel news. There's 7,000 of us now. 7,000 subscribers on my channel, which I think is unbelievable. I, um, I didn't think the growth would be that quick, to be honest, and a thousand new subscribers have come on board in the last month. So welcome to the channel. 
Um, I'll try not to be as boring as I am today. Uh, I usually have more thought out and structured videos, but I just wanted to post something this week because I haven't had a chance to actually do any astronomy with this weather. I want to do a few shout outs. Uh, so I'd like to shout out Ray's Astronomy. He's always uh, commenting and supporting on my channel. Also a shout out to Galactic Hunter, who are a couple, girlfriend and boyfriend team of astronomers. And they do really well produced videos. You should check out their channel. Uh, shout out to Chris Thompson, who uh, let me know that the filter draw system for the Star Arizona from Star Arizona will actually work with the 8 inch Rasa. So that was very good news. Thank you for letting me know, Chris Thompson. Uh, shout out to Astronomy Livestream, who also leaves comments and supports my videos. So thank you very much for that. LA Shots, Knott's Boy 24, Andrew Wall from South Australia, Wolfie 6020, and lots more. But I can't shout everyone out. For all of you who regularly leave comments on my videos, thank you very much. I actually read every single comment and I try to get back to all of them if I can as well. Okay, so a few question and answers. Mars Aspen Murray asks, what are the differences apart from the obvious differences in design between the Rasa and Hyperstar? How much better is the image quality with the Rasa and how much easier is it to use? And that's a good question. Hyperstar and the Rasa are pretty much the same thing. Ultimately, they are the same thing. They work the same way and you end up with F2 um, with similar focal lengths. So what's the difference? Um, well, obviously with the Hyperstar, you can take it on and off. So if you've got a Hyperstar on a nine and a quarter or an 11, you can then take that off and use the nine and a quarter or 11 at its full focal length. And that's really handy. Uh, on the other hand, the Rasa, you don't need to muck around with stuff. You can just set it straight up and it works. Uh, but for the difference in image quality, um, in real world scenario, I haven't noticed very much of a difference. It's pretty much much of a muchness. It's quite similar. Um, so I wouldn't worry too much about the difference of it. Both will work very well. However, someone special did leave some comments and that was Mark Rackerman, the guy who actually helped invent the Rasa, whose name is part of the bro Ackerman, Schmidt Astrograph. Uh, Mark's been leaving comments in the comment section, um, answering some user questions about the Rasa and how it performs. Um, so really, I, I couldn't ask for a better expert to defer to. So um, hit him up in the comments. Thanks, Mark. MGTOW35 asks, what does it mean a 1.2 megapixel against 16 megapixel is in astrophotography really? Is it about the real zoom size of a photo as happens in reflex cameras or quality of the final product? Here's the thing about megapixels. It's sort of a bit of a marketing buzzword. It does mean something. It's if you take the X axis and the Y axis, count all the pixels on each one and then multiply those numbers together, you get the total number of pixels on the chip. They take that number, round it to the nearest million, and then that's your megapixel value. Um, it doesn't really tell you much other than how many pixels are in the camera. Of course, the bigger the number is better because the more pixels you have, presumably the more resolution you'll have, which is a good thing. Um, however, that doesn't tell you anything about sampling. It doesn't tell you about oversampling or undersampling. And for that, you need to know the pixel size. Uh, because you might have a lot of pixels, but if all those pixels are huge, your frame is going to be huge, the, you'll have vignetting on the corners. The, the megapixel value does not give you a good indication of whether or not a camera will be good for astrophotography. If you really want to know whether a camera will be good for astrophotography, plug in the values into the Bintel astronomy calculator and that will give you a good sampling result and it will tell you whether that camera is suited to your telescope and that sort of thing. Uh, and I get that question a lot about which camera should I buy and, and people posting camera names in the comments. And I always say, just go and plug those values into the calculator. It'll give you a, a better answer than I can about whether that camera is suitable for you. Centrioless asks about the Rasa. I'm new to the whole ast astrophotography thingy. May I know if it's possible to use this Rasa for general viewing or is it strictly for astrophotography only? It's just for astrophotography. It's definitely not for visual, but you know, who cares? Julian Kurt asks, hey, I'm completely new to astrophotography. How much do I need to spend for at least a complete setup? <sighs> well, that's a big question. Uh, you can take astrophotographs with, without a telescope. You can just use a DSLR camera and shoot Milky Way photography. The more equipment you get, the more you can do though. And especially if you want to do deep space, you kind of need tracking mounts. You need, you might need filters. So it can get expensive from there. So for a complete deep space setup, um, 
you know, it's a few thousand. You subscriber. <laughs> I love this thing. So yeah, it could be anywhere from a few thousand to tens of thousands. And I have to admit, I'm probably in the tens of thousands now. Also, special shout out to all the Christians in my comment section who want to tell me that my sign off when I say everything is meaningless and we're all going to die, um, they start going on and on about Jesus and Christ and blah, blah, blah. Um, my sign off, everything is meaningless, is a quote from the Bible. So don't come at me with uh, your comments. Talk to God, because he wrote it. Uh, Freya Gray writes, subscribing because you're cute, smart, and Australian. But I'm guessing you're straight, laughing my ass off. Uh, yes, I'm straight and married. Sorry about that. Uh, Slap Astronomy writes, after two years of use, how is the mount holding up, the CGX mount? I have the CGM and the CG5, and they perform really well. Uh, and he's talking about the uh, next mount. Uh, that CGX is the best mount I've ever had. I used to have the CG5, and I found it horrible. Um, Celestron really weren't doing so well in the mount department until the CGX came out. They had a few early manufacturing issues, but I believe they've all been resolved. The actual design and the way the CGX works is really good. I've had very, very good stable tracking and clear images, um, even at high focal lengths, and even with large loads on the CGX. Of course, you'd need a CGXL if you're going for the 14 inch or something like that. Uh, but yeah, I, I have nothing but good things to say about the CGX mount and I recommend it to anyone. Uh, RPG Entertainment writes, I always measure my dick in inches, lol, just saying. Um, yeah, but if you talk about it in centimetres, it's a bigger number. ALSP writes, Dylan, I'm hard. LEKH writes in the comments that he doesn't think that you can subtract darks with the six, ASI 1600 and he says that you should be dithering instead and that's a good point i am um, definitely dither with anything i do but when i did that dark stack i did see non-random noise and if there is non-random noise in the stack then you know it's also in the image that you stack as well so i'm not sure how true this is but i would be keen to be corrected uh, if anyone knows anything about darks with the 1600 i would love to be corrected if i'm wrong but I did stack it and that non-random noise profile was there. Thomas Butts writes, I've done visual work for about 15 years. Once I started astrophotography three years ago, I haven't looked through an eyepiece since. <laughs> yep. I've lost another subscriber. Well, I think that's about it. I'm just gonna post this quick video. Sorry it wasn't an actual video, but I probably better post before I lose any more subscribers. So clear skies, and remember everything is meaningless and we're all going to die.